Essence guys. In today's video, I will be sharing with you a rather interesting part of Jamaica's history. Rather unknown and interesting. Now, this is the Montego Bay Rebellion of 19 or uh, 1902 yeah the montego bay rebellion of 1902 i know a lot of persons have not heard about this story so i will be making it interesting trying to put it in story form and all of that i will be trying to do a lot of these videos tidbits of jamaican history unknown history of jamaica in the future so please sit back relax and try to enjoy this one and give me your feedback guys all right blessings thanks again for joining enjoy the video at midnight on April 5th, 1902, after walking home from dinner with Dr. Bill Farquharson, the district medical officer, Police Inspector Herbert Thomas received this urgent telegram from Sergeant Major Phillips in Montego Bay. Inspector Thomas took the message seriously and decided to make the 25-mile journey from Lucy to Montego Bay. Inspector Thomas located Sergeant Major Johnson, who agreed to use his parry cart, a two-wheeled vehicle not much larger than a wheelbarrow, and the two men set off carrying carbines with bayonets, 20 rounds of ball cartridge, and some clothes. Inspector Thomas and Sergeant Major Johnson arrived at the Montego Bay Police Station close to 4 a.m. Sunday morning, April 6, 1902. Like the calm after a storm, it was early quiet. The station's broken window panes and the many bricks, stones, conch shells and bottles scattered in the station's courtyard spoke of earlier chaos. Inspector Thomas hurried inside to assure himself of the safety of Montego Bay Sergeant Major and Constables. All reported that they were fined, if a bit shaken up. Inspector Thomas was informed that the unrest began late in the afternoon of Friday, April 5th when a drunken sailor named Cooper was arrested for disorderly conduct close to 5 p.m. and the two women who were with him were treated badly by the arresting officer. The arresting officer was attacked by a group of roughs, friends of Cooper's from the docks. Some 2,000 others turned up at the courthouse and began to hail stones down at the windows. Sergeant Major's home was attacked and his wife and children were forced to flee for their lives. The police eventually released Cooper, but the rioters were not appeased. Police on beat duty were attacked, as was police guard room at the courthouse where Sergeant Major Phillips was stationed, attempting to hold off the crowd with his revolver. He was eventually forced to retreat into the police station after firing a shot into the crowd that wounded one of the attackers. At that point, the crowd advanced on the courthouse guard room and destroyed everything in sight. They then turned their attention to the police station. All subsequent arrests were also released and the custos addressed the people. Rioting ceased for the night and not believing the worst to be over, Sergeant Major Phillips began to send telegraphs calling for reinforcements. Inspector Thomas and Sergeant Major Johnson were among the first to arrive. At that point, satisfied that he had be been brought to speed, Inspector Thomas took an early morning stroll around Montego Bay to see for himself that calm prevailed before returning to the station for a short nap. Later that morning, more reinforcements arrived so that in addition to the town's regular police force, Montego Bay boasted the presence of the Inspector General, three inspectors, a Sergeant Major and 60 armed men. Upon arrival at the railway station, however, the reinforcements got an indication of what they would be up against as they were greeted by a confident crowd of close to 1,500, many of whom were said to have remarked, Cho, that's not half enough for us tonight. Some of the inspectors, including Herbert Thomas of Lucy, began to suspect that what happened the night before was only a small taste of what was to come. Others, including the Inspector General, convinced themselves that the worst was over and that order would be maintained. All remained quiet during the day and church services proceeded smoothly. Adjutant Simons of the Salvation Army, who worked amongst the poor in the community, took it upon himself to address the crowd that had begun to gather once again. Although he is said to have been attempting to place himself over the crowd in the hope of diverting attention from the police, he staged a march to the tune of unward Christian soldiers. When loud roars and bugle calls could be heard approaching the town centre, 
Inspector Thomas was ordered to investigate. He wound up walking towards a mob of some 2,000 angry people and promptly took refuge in the police station, arriving there only a few minutes before the mob. The marchers managed to gain attack to again attack the police officers on beat, rain attacks on the police barracks and even assault the inspector general. Police whistles added to the din of angry voices. Stones began to fly and many of the police officers on duty in front of the station were wounded. Forced to retreat inside and regroup, Inspector Thomas remembers, finding that some of the men had begun to fix their bayonets, I immediately ordered them to desist and show them how to use the butt end of the carbine. By this time, I had unlocked the big gate, which was used to allow vehicles to enter the yard, and I suddenly flung it open, taking the mob completely by surprise and charging right into the heart of it with butts of the carbines. The streets were immediately strewn with the wounded and the crowd temporarily dispersed, as quoted in Block 1984, page 38. By the time Inspector General arrived at the police station, his white jacket stained with blood and his arm hanging limply at his side, 20 men had been wounded, some seriously, including Inspector O'Toole of Falmouth, who had been carried in unconscious due to a blow on his temple from a brick. The Inspector General, who knew he had barely escaped with his life, ordered Inspector Thomas to gather all police constables who were able into armed party to clear the streets and town square, firing if necessary. Thomas did as he was told. The street, he remembered, was so strewn with missiles of various kinds, which were also rained upon us as we marched along, that men were tripping and falling every three or four yards. And we did not dare leave any of them on the road, or they would have surely perished at the hands of the mob. Seeing no prospect, Otherwise putting an end to the disturbance, and as our numbers were being steadily depleted by casualties, casualties, I myself being the only officer, not yet disabled, I gave the order for independent firing, that means fire at will. Some 25 shots were fired altogether, and the effect was magical. The mob, many of whom believed that blank cartridges were being used, were stunned when the bullets began to fly. Within three minutes, Thomas noted, the square was clear while a terrified silence prevailed. The Montego Bay riots had ended, but the security forces were taking no chances. On Monday, April 7th, the HMS Tribune docked in Montego Bay from Port Royal, thereby increasing Montego Bay's peacekeeping force to 750 armed men. The acting governor, Mr. and later Lord Oliver, also arrived by special train as did a company of the West India Regiment. A reinforcement of 100 police had also been sent to replace the wounded. Of the four officers and 70 other ranks engaged, police casualties were upwards of 50% of their numbers. Two of the rioters lost their lives and some 24 were injured. A meeting of the Privy Council was held and a commission appointed to investigate the entire affair. Not since Morant Bay has there been such a rising against constituted authority, claimed the Daily Telegraph newspaper. The commission's conclusion was that the riots were as a result of hostility to the police. Inspector Thomas of the Lucy Police Station believed they were related to a tightening of police control after years of laxity because Montego Bay, lightly policed and suffering from high rates of unemployment, had become the most rowdy and disorderly town in the island. Yet, the Jamaica Advocate, editorializing on the events of April 5 to 7, 1902, placed the blame for the riots on the government's recently instituted land taxation policy in its attempt to deal with a severe economic depression. Chronic irritation and discontent, which have for some time existed among the poorer classes as the consequence of the grinding, crushing weight of the takes of which they are unable to pay and the prosecutions which have been recently instituted against them for not being able to pay, as cited in Brian, 1991, page 274. About a week or so before the riots, there had been many attempts to collect taxes. Many had been brought before the resident magistrate for non-payment. Many also objected to the manner in which they were treated concerning the payment of taxes, often arrested or threatened rather than summoned and unable to pay and unwilling to go to prison. The aftermath, the Inspector General was made a commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George and also received a large cash sum. 
However, he died six months later while on leave in England, most likely as a result of the wounds he sustained in Montego Bay. A few other inspectors received large sums of money. In a move that foreshadowed happenings during another set of April riots, almost 100 years later, the gas riots of Kingston of April 1999, the government, alarmed by all that had taken place, decided to put tax proposal on hold for at least a year. History, it seems, does have a way of representing itself. Thank you guys for joining me. If you enjoyed this piece of history brought to you in story form, please do subscribe to the channel as I will be trying to do this like two or three times per week. Thank you again for joining me. I am Alex. Bless.